Hello, Thomas. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing very fine, Errol. I tell you what, before we even get started, I want to thank you for your dedication, your loyalty, your determination for this nation. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Being a part of the FBI, to so many people, you are Batman, you are Superman, you are the Calvary, and, and everybody expects you to solve the crime in 22 minutes before the next commercial break. Well, you summed it up very well. You summed <laughs> it up very well, Harold. The, the, the name of the book is The Fall of the FBI. This is a book of honesty. Uh, it's taken so long to get this out here for us to understand because there's a lot of us out, out here, sir, that we don't understand. But this book really opens up our eyes. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm glad that you feel that way because that's what I tried to do. And I've had literally uh, tens and tens of, of other former agents and a couple of onboard agents tell me they really appreciate me doing this, uh, that it needs to be said and it needs to be done. I was going to say, it sounds, you know, when, when you read it, it's a voice. It's someone who says, I not only live this, but it's time that we reach into the future and teach this. Yes, that's what I tried to do. Uh, a sub-theme of the book is, is the good, the bad, and the ugly. And what I try to do is show what the FBI had been, how good it was, how we were trained to operate within the parameters of the Constitution, and how it was a priority protect, protecting people's civil rights and liberties. And unfortunately, um, in, in very recent history, that, that aim has been subverted, through which I believe, through a change in culture. Yeah. It's not just the work of a few bad apples. There's been a cultural change, and it has to be corrected. Well, it, it kind of reminds me, in, in reading the book and stuff like that, how it's shifted like the Supreme Court is shifting. And it's like, oh, my God, it's right there before our eyes, but nobody is doing anything about it. Well, I, my book is a call for people to do things about it. It's very sad what has happened, Yeah, uh, and it needs to be said. There's a role for the FBI itself in reforming itself. And it can be done. It's very difficult, but it can be done. But there's also a very specific role for Congress. Abuses have come to light against U.S. citizens. Uh, the, the abuse of the FISA Act, uh, that's to say the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and its use against Americans, that's been clearly documented. That has to change, and Congress has a role there. Uh, and other abuses have come to light uh, that perhaps are not that widely known by the general public, the unmasking of U.S. citizens whose names came up on surveillances of foreigners, uh, that has to be corrected. That, that was an abuse. It happened repeatedly. It came to light, particularly in the General Flynn matter. Yeah. Uh, and his rights were abused uh, by the misuse of, of uh, well, the, the, several things that was deliberate, actually, to trick him into lying. But that's an, a, a very specific problem. Is do you, do you think one of the situations here is 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 not just the agency, but it's also the lawyers who can sit down and craft out some of the greatest presentations and, and they can bend the truth. They can bend it this way as long as they convince a jury. Well, um, I think the thing that the thing I, I emphasize in my book is the fact that in a law enforcement culture, you live every day, consciously or unconsciously, to the day when you're before a jury mm -hmm. and you have to raise your right hand and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That's one of the things that distinguishes us, distinguishes law enforcement from an intelligence agency where every day they deal in lies and deception. They live by deception and deceit. Uh, and that creates a whole different mindset and a whole different approach to your work. Yeah. And it. Having a law, uh, an intelligence agency domestic is in and of itself a threat to American civil liberties, and it has to be watched very closely. The, for some reason, it, when, when I'm reading the book and stuff like that, with the way that things have shifted inside the FBI, I, the, my heart told me, my God, this is like the KGB, which is run by the government. I thought the FBI was its own institution. Well, the FBI has been afforded, historically, a high degree of independence, and the FBI directors in the past have exercised a high degree of independence. And, and that has actually a positive aspect when <clears throat> the political masters, whether it's the attorney general or the president, um, 
uh, has them in instructing them to go a bit off the reservation. And we see examples of that. Historically, we've seen going back to J. Edgar Hoover, for all his faults and all the criticism of it, he did stand up to FDR and resisted the internment of Japanese citizens. Mm -hmm. The FBI did not participate in that. It wound up having to be done by the immigration authorities and by the U.S. Army. Uh, Hoover also stood up to Richard Nixon when he wanted him to do the activities that later Nixon had the plumbers group do. Yeah. Uh, Comey and, and, uh, and Mueller, to their, to their credit, early on stood up at one point, and this is documented in, in several books, stood up to George W. Bush when he wanted to use some electronic surveillance against American citizens within this country. They resisted that. There has to be continuous exercise like that of independence. Uh, we, we did not see that most recently last October when the Attorney General, Merrick Garland, sent out an order to all the U.S. attorneys and to the FBI to monitor the school board meetings. Yep. The FBI internally has said that they're not doing that unless there's violence at school board meetings. But we really need the voice of the director standing up and saying, this is wrong, we won't do it. And we really haven't heard that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on the line when it comes to James Comey, because many times I, I have so much compassion for what he has done and, and what he has gone through. But at the same time, I can't tell if he's a good guy or the bad guy. I mean, I mean that's the way that social media has painted this man's story. Well, uh, we had instructors at the FBI Academy years ago. There was one particular instructor, and he said to us, uh, first you're good, uh, then you think you're good, and then you're no good. Oh, God. What he was trying to tell us is don't get too ahead of your own virtue and don't let your virtue carry you away. And I'm afraid that's what happened with James Comey. Uh, he was very virtuous as deputy attorney general, and as I said, did stand up and resist some of these orders. When he first became FBI director, he was welcomed. He was considered a humanitarian by the employees at FBI headquarters. Uh, but part of that, of course, was his management style. He was very hands off. He floated above it all, is how he's described by others who worked with him. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to the two previous directors, Mueller and even before Mueller, uh, Louis Free were very hands-on uh, and very demanding, each in their own way. The book we're talking about is The Fall of the FBI. One of the great, I have to give you a kudos and compliment on this, Thomas, in the way that you tell the history. You, I, say, I believe in that. It's, a, it's like a martial artist. If you don't know the history of your martial art, then, then you're not, you, you, don't, you don't get the, the black belt. And, and what you do here is that you tell us the history. For instance, like the, the, the Klansman demonstration in, in Jackson, Florida. What, what was it that really drew you closer into this story? Well, that's a good example and, and how the FBI was then. Uh, and and I, I re first of all, I was actually on the scene of that incident, as you know, you apparently obviously have read that chapter. Uh, and it was at uh, a crisis time throughout America. Martin Luther King was murdered. Uh, and this led as part of the reaction within days, there were riots in several cities, including Washington, D.C. And the, the riots and the burning got within uh, a few blocks of the White House and 16 people were killed in Washington and that that we didn't have in those days the FBI what what is evolved and up and was used until the recent problems the attorney general guidelines we didn't really have guidelines as to what to do so you had the national leadership the president Lyndon Baines Johnson and others uh wanting things do something that was the orders do something and uh, all of a sudden we hear that there's this mourner's march. Most of the agents went out in, uh, in Jacksonville, directed by King's brother, to monitor that thing. And they even said, we said, to you, what, what, is our, what do you mean monitor it? Were we there to protect the people? Were we there to protect the civil rights? Were we there to watch, uh, to surveil them, to watch out for violence or riots? It wasn't clear what the role of the FBI was. We really needed what we got later, the attorney general guidelines. I was one of a half dozen agents 
uh, who were not monitoring that thing. And all of a sudden we hear that the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan, yep. which was far more powerful then than it is today, was staging a counter demonstration. They were marching down the street. And as I relate in some detail in the book, um, I got in a fight, a, sh a scuffle, uh, a Klansman and an agent exchanged punches and I jumped in with two other guys and two other agents and we arrested this Klansman. Um, and fortunately the 50 or 100 Klansmen who were marching by, they just yelled and cursed at us, but they didn't move in to fight us. And I thank God, because we would have gotten beat up. Wow. We wouldn't have used our weapons against them, but we would have, as, as ha happened on other occasions, fight them. But route numbered 50 to 1, they would have beaten the hell out of us. But that's that's how things went in those days. And that time is behind us, thank God. Oh, man, you just painted a picture that, uh, you know, what, the things that the FBI has to go through in order to get the job done. And and I had the image when you were talking about the, the situation with the Klansmen of, of the bank robbery that was in Los Angeles, where the FBI was was there on the scene. But they're the ones that also took the biggest hit. It, it's, it's almost like you're the Marines of law enforcement. Well, yes. And, and I must say, and, and the book brings it out. And obviously you picked up on that. It, it, some of this was very exciting, and I must say I don't regret my career at all, and I learned a lot, and I think we've done some, and institutionally, the FBI has done a lot of good, especially with innovations in uh, in crime fighting, crime detection, uh, all of those things that have come about and are available now to state and local police, but the, the danger from becoming more of an intelligence agency to people's civil liberties is something I'm very concerned about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that, that you experienced that a lot of us, we saw it through the television set, but you were there when President Reagan was hit. And, and I can't imagine what that did to you as a human being, as well as a protector of the United States of America. Well, that was, that was quite something. And I devote a chapter of that in the book. Uh, I was, through her circumstance, again, I was the first agent on the scene in Washington, D.C. when Reagan was shot, first FBI agent. And, and then I directed the investigation, the initial investigation, and the initial response to that. And we viewed it as a crisis at the time because the world was very tense. Reagan had only been in office two months, and he was had initiated a, a much stronger stand against the Soviet Union and support of uh, what was going on in Poland at the time. And for the first hour or two, we didn't know what we had. And now everybody knows that the attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan was the act of one mentally disturbed young man. Mm -hmm. But at the time, we didn't, we didn't realize that initially, and we were very much uh, in a state of high alert. A uh, positive thing came out of that, my experience was there was great cooperation with the local police, the Washington Metropolitan Police and the Secret Service through, throughout that response. That was wonderful and heartening. And I contrasted in the book to what had happened 20 years earlier when President Kennedy was shot. Uh, it was a law enforcement fiasco. The various law enforcement agencies were all fighting with each other. And that led ultimately to the suspect being killed which then led to all the conspiracy theories that that are still swirling around us mm. uh, there are no conspiracy theories about the attempted assassination of ronald reagan that investigation was handled correctly and i was very looking back on it i was proud to be part of it what you have gone through thomas i mean from president reagan to 9-11 Princess Diana, St. Mother Teresa. This book is almost like you you have held the, the pages up against a mirror and said, look, I need to release it. I need to put it in this because my heart is heavy right now and I, I, I got to get on with my life. But at the same time, I don't want to forget anything in my life. Boy, you summed that up very well, Earl. Um, it, it is heartbreaking what has happened to the FBI lately, but I felt in the book I had to address the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. And the ugly is the last several years and what maybe we can do about it. Um, but th there was a lot of good early on and back to that. Mm -hmm. When you get into a situation 
And and you know that first of all, I think I think that the thing about the FBI that I've always loved about them is that they're like they're like glorified journalists because I see how the journalists get in there to do the investigation, and I'm jealous of the FBI because they get more intelligence, they get more information than journalists do and stuff like that. You you have this skill of of locating stories, and those stories are what we get on this side of it, and and you get to solve crimes. Well, I think, and, and I try to do this in the book, and you just put your finger on it, stories. Uh, people learn and, and people absorb things by stories. A good story sticks in someone's mind yep. and they learn the lesson of the good story. And that's what I tried to do in the book. Are you going to turn this into a 12-part series on Netflix? Because you know darn good and well this book needs to have moving pictures. Well, that would be a lot of fun, but we'll <laughs> see. Right? Right now, the book was just released today, Tuesday, December 6th. So now it's available in bookstores, and it's still available online, of course, at Amazon and similar sites. Did you have to go through any special editing? Because when I'm when I'm blessed with the opportunity to talk to a lot of U.S. men, uh, soldiers, men and women, and they have to go through a government editing process. Did you have to go through anything like that? I submitted the book in February 18th to a pre-publication review yeah. in the Bureau's Records Division, and I had some correspondence back and forth with them, and I, I highlighted to them where some of the information in the book came from, uh, and that's that's where it stood. I, I laid it all out for them, and I haven't been told to retract anything yet. Oh, nice. Now, has the definition of violence been redefined in, in the way that it seems like there's a lot of armchair quarterback FBI agents out there in these small towns? They think they've got it already handled, and it, it, it's like they, they don't want to turn to the guys that really know how to do it. Um, I, I'm, I'm quite, uh, Earl, I'm not quite sure exactly what your question is there. In other, in other words, with, with a lot of these crimes in, in, in cities these days, it's almost like they're saying, we've got this. We've seen it happen before, where the FBI was like always first on the scene. They, they, they were the ones that were getting the evidence. But nowadays, it seems like these, these smaller groups of officers and stuff like that, we, let's don't call in the big guys yet. Let's see if we can figure this out first. And a lot of mistakes are being made. Well, yes, and mistakes are made that way. I think in a lot of these, uh, I, I think one example is the situation in Idaho, uh, the recent yep. uh, mass yep. killing there, uh, and other states. A lot of, in the West, and I'm, through my consulting work since I left the Bureau, I'm familiar with the situation in Minnesota and Colorado, for two examples, and I believe it's very similar in Idaho. You have a state investigative agency that has a lot of skill, a lot of trained people, a lot of forensic backup. And throughout those states, you have small, very small police departments, one or two sometimes offices, uh, small sheriff's offices. Most of the sheriffs and chiefs in these small towns are, are very wise today, and they, they welcome help, and they, they take the help. And in the, the states I'm familiar with, the uh, state agency goes in and helps them with forensics, with with setting up and and sometimes like in the case in idaho the fbi can come in they have a whole kit rapid start they can set up and start working a major investigation most today most small police chiefs and sheriffs are very willing to take that help and recognize they need the help and the the smart uh, state agencies and the smart fbi managers uh, they stand aside and let that chief or the sheriff in that small town still be there at the press conferences and still have his role out front talking to the public uh, there is a high degree of cooperation there are a lot of forensics and other tools available that weren't available you know even 10 or 20 years ago in some cases uh, I, I think it's a foolish person who doesn't take the help and cooperation. Absolutely. Thomas, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you, Earl. You be brilliant today, okay, sir? Same with you. Bye.